Hi, friends. Let's go over angina pectoris today or angina pectoris. It's pronounced like both ways, but it doesn't matter. Just recognize what the word is, what it means for um, the NPTE and kind of some symptoms that show up with angina pectoris. So let's get into it. So anatomy, so as we know, it's going to be associated with the heart. So the main thing that's going on with the heart is that the coronary vessels are the main vessels that are going to be affected because this is a type of symptom that is associated with coronary artery disease. And so we see that the arteries begin to narrow due to most likely plaque buildup, like nine times out of 10, it's plaque buildup. And so we're going to see as these arteries narrow that there's not enough blood getting to the myocardium. So that's the member, the muscle layer, the heart, which contracts the heart, um, kind of need that to have oxygen or else your heart's not going to pump well. And so what that's, what's happening is a temporary period of ischemia. Remember ischemia is temporary loss of blood flow to the area. And so that's why it's going to show up as chest pain. Cause if we're not having oxygen get to our heart muscles, then it can't pump. And then it's like kind of fatiguing and failing. So think about like, if you were like blood flow restriction to like your quad, if you were trying to, um, you know, contract your quad and everything, but you have your tourniquet around your leg, it's going to start becoming painful and hurt and it's going to become weak and not be able to contract. That's essentially what's happening with angina pectoris in the heart is that you're having a tourniquet kind of happen to the um, coronary arteries temporarily. And so that's going to cause pain. So if you think of it that way, it kind of makes a little bit more sense. So as I said before, the etiology of this pathology is that it's going to be the same as coronary artery disease. Essentially, angina pectoris is a symptom manifestation of coronary artery disease that we can see in the clinic often happen with our patients who have um, high level well, coronary artery disease. So how it's going to show up is all of the same um, symptoms, signs, and basically Patho pathophysiology, it's all the same. Just understand that um, etiologies associated with coronary artery disease are going to mainly be athero slash arterial sclerosis, which comes from a high lipid diet. And if we see a high amount of cholesterol in the blood, that's going to be called hyperlipidemia. So if you see hyperlipidemia, think arthro or slash arterial sclerosis. So that's going to build up with a plaque and the arteries, and then that's going to start to occlude the arteries. So essentially, the walls are caving in on the artery, which is going to limit blood flow. And then if we're limiting blood flow um, by limiting that space, remember when we put our finger over the hose, it starts to go faster. And that's what's kind of happening with more pressure coming out. That's how we will see hypertension when it comes to um, coronary artery disease. So we're going to start seeing hypertension in the coronary arteries. Um, general hypertension of the body uh, can also cause coronary artery disease. Smoking and alcohol abuse, that's going to also be a uh, cause of coronary artery disease because remember, uh, smoking is going to cause vasoconstriction and then alcohol abuse is going to mess with the liver, which is going to inhibit the liver's ability to process, um, to like secrete bile to help emulsify fat. And then we're going to have problems with that. It's a whole issue. Basically, smoking and alcohol never cause any good things to happen in the body. Stress, as we know, stress can lead to hypertension which can then lead to some coronary artery disease problems. And then obesity and inactivity is going to decrease our ability to metabolize and um, eliminate a lot of the cholesterol and fat in the body, which then it's going to accumulate in the arteries. And then diabetes mellitus just causes so many problems vascularly. It's going to cause um, like lots of vasoconstriction as well, decreased perfusion of oxygen from the arteries into the muscle. And so we're going to see that that's also going to happen in the heart because the heart's a muscle too. So essentially the big thing to understand with angina pectoris, if you were like, if you lost me a little bit there, is that this is going to cause a narrowing of the coronary arteries, which is going to lead to partial ischemia or periods of ischemia, which is a like temporary occlusion of the coronary vessels. So if we lose blood flow to the area, we're going to lose um, oxygen being delivered to the tissues in the area, aka the myocardium. And so therefore it's going to lead to chest pain because think of like this is a tourniquet in your heart. And then we take the tourniquet off. Remember, like if you take the tourniquet off, it's like extremely painful as blood rushes back into the area um, after a temporary period of uh, occlusion. And then just having the tourniquet on, which is when the vessels are occluded, that's also going to cause a severe amount of pain. So the arteries in the heart are being squished and this is causing chest pain. So let's kind of talk about um, 
This is a type of angina pectoris that I just want to go over really quickly before we get into the ones that actually kind of matter. So if you see this thing called Prinz metal angina, so P-R-I-N-Z-M-E-T-A-L angina, this is the one that occurs in the morning. Probably won't be asked about this, but treat it like a stable angina. So I just want to let you guys know about this one before we get into the ones that really matter. So if you see this word, be like angina in the morning. All right, guys. So what does actual angina look like? So we got two types that we're mainly going to focus on. I know I just mentioned one, um, but the two types that are most important that the boards are going to ask about are stable angina versus unstable angina. So it's really, really, really important that you guys know the difference between these two, because this is where the safety questions come into play. And so you guys will understand what I mean by this in a moment. So stable angina is chest pain that occurs during activity. So angina itself just means pain in the chest. So stable angina occurs during activity. So like they're walking, they're like even running, biking, something like that. Like they're doing something active, climbing up the stairs or something like that. And then they're getting symptoms of chest pain. The symptoms of stable angina should be relieved with rest. So just tell the patient they're having chest pain. Just say, Hey, sit down for like five minutes and just kind of chill out. And let's see what happens. Or if they chill out for five minutes and they're still having some chest pain, they can be administered sublingual nitroglycerin, which is just a tablet that goes under your tongue, which is going to promote uh, vasodilation, which as we know, the vessels are occluded. So they need to dilate to get blood flow to the area. That's what nitroglycerin does. And within five minutes of taking nitroglycerin, it should open back up and the patient should be fine. So rest and nitroglycerin rest and or nitroglycerin should be what relieves stable angina and then the symptoms go away. Um, I will kind of talk about the things with nitroglycerin in a moment. Stable angina is predictable. So the patient's like, yeah, I know like if I walk up four flights of stairs by the third flight, I'm starting to get chest pain. Or like the patient knows that like, yeah, if I'm like walking around my neighborhood, if I walk faster than like three miles per hour, I start getting chest pain. So like, it's very predictable when stable angina will show up. So the patient's like, I know if I go too fast, it'll show up. I know if I walk too many stairs, it'll show up. Like we can easily, I don't want to say easily, but like, you know, with trial and error, we can predict that, okay, these symptoms are going to show up with these activities. Maybe they don't show up with walking, but they show up with running kind of thing. We know when these symptoms are going to show up with stable angina. It's predictable. We know what's going on. The symptoms of angina in general will present as chest pain, pain up into the jaw, neck, or arm, and then shortness of breath and pain radiating into the back. So what does that sound like? A heart attack. So that's why this is like very, very important that we kind of know the difference between stable and unstable because unstable angina with all of those symptoms not being relieved can progress to a myocardial infarction, AKA heart attack. So unstable angina symptoms will appear at rest. So the patient's just sitting there not doing anything and they're having chest pain. Not good. There's no like, you know, chest pain with increased oxygen demand to the body with activity kind of makes sense. We're working the heart more, we get the chest pain. But then when we stop working the heart more, it chills out. The heart's not working hard at rest. It's just chilling. So if we're having pain at rest, that means that there's a serious problem going on and we're having serious levels of ischemia because even that baseline level of chilling out is causing the heart to like decompensate. And so we'll see that these symptoms with unstable angina are not relieved by rest or nitroglycerin. So that means that we tell them to chill out. They're already having pain at rest. We can't rest any more than we're already resting. Uh-oh, not good. Um, and then if we're like, let's give them nitroglycerin and the symptoms don't resolve and we're like, uh-oh, not good. Remember, we can give nitroglycerin three times. And by we, we just tell the patient, it might be a good idea to take your nitroglycerin. Um, they should be uh, informed by their doctor, cardiologist, how to you know, administer nitroglycerin to themselves, put it under their tongue, let it dissolve and everything. Um, I hear it tastes kind of funky. So tell them like, hey, funky taster, you know, go to the hospital. They'll, they'll, they'll take it. Um, so they'll take their nitroglycerin. They'll wait like five minutes. And then we'll be like, okay, like, Take another one if you're still having symptoms. Take their nitroglycerin, they wait five minutes. So now we're at the 10 minute mark. And then we're like, mm, okay, can you take another one just in case? And so they take a third one. We wait five minutes. Now we're at the 15 minute mark. Symptoms have not been relieved in 15 minutes. Now that we see that, we know, okay, this is now progressing to unstable angina. We cannot give them too much nitroglycerin 
or their blood pressure is going to be like 60 over 40. It's going to bottom out because remember vasodilation, that's going to decrease the blood pressure, open everything up. That's going to drop their blood pressure to dangerous levels. We don't want them to bottom out on us. Not good because then um, the only thing that's going to help them is like fluid administration, which we can't do. So got to get them into the hospital. So if their symptoms are not relieved within 15 minutes of taking nitroglycerin, that means that this has progressed to unstable angina. So we see, oh no, this has progressed to unstable angina. Not good at all. We need to call EMS. So that's why um, we want to call our emergency services because they've been having all this chest pain, the shortness of breath, all of these problems that are literally heart attack symptoms. They've been presenting with this for 15 minutes. Um, we need to get them to the hospital to make sure that they're not actually having a heart attack now because unstable angina can very easily creep from some chest pain over into they're having a full on um, infarction of their heart and their heart's dying. So that's why we got to get them to the hospital. Here's the thing though. Symptoms will present exactly the same for all different types of angina. They'll present chest pain, pain into the jaw, neck, or arm, shortness of breath, and pain radiating into the back, which is also the same as a heart attack. So it's important to look at your patient and be like, okay, they're having all these symptoms, like we see a patient, like they have all these symptoms, but they also have a past medical history of angina and they're prescribed nitroglycerin. So instead of just being like, oh my gosh, they're having a heart attack. What do I do? Try the nitroglycerin first. Like it's not a problem until we actually have a problem. Try the nitroglycerin first. That doesn't work. Okay. Now we got a problem. So what are we doing with these patients? So I'm going to go over unstable angina first. Unstable angina, easy. Call EMS and exercise is contraindicated until their angina is under control because you don't want it to be a heart attack. So how are we treating unstable? We're not. We're sending them to people who get paid a lot more than us to deal with that because they're going to administer various medications. Maybe they're having such bad stuff that they need to go get a cardiac catheterization, something like that, that requires like invasive procedures that we're not poking and prodding into people and cutting them open. So we're sending them to the hospital to get that taken care of to make sure it's not progressing to a myocardial infarction. Now, if they have stable angina, what are we doing? So they're starting to have chest pain symptoms while they're like walking on the treadmill. We're going to say, okay, let, let's stop exercise. How about we sit down and take a break? Give the patient nitroglycerin if they're still having some symptoms. And if they don't resolve within five minutes, give them another tablet kind of thing. Um, remember, only three tablets max or else you like, you're like you going to bottom them out. And if you've given the three tablets and they're still having symptoms, as I said before, okay, we're calling 911 because now it's not relieved with nitroglycerin and it's not relieved with rest, which what does that mean? Not relieved with nitroglycerin or rest. That means we're now at unstable angina. That is considered a medical emergency. We are sending them to the ER or we're calling 911 to come get them because this could be bad. If the, pa and that's, this is all what you do if the patient becomes symptomatic. If the patient's unsymptomatic or asymptomatic, great. What are we doing with the patient in PT? We're working on cardiovascular endurance, slowly training the heart to accommodate to more aerobic load and increasing aerobic endurance. So essentially we're just doing, you know, a graded exercise program. Like maybe we do 2.3 on the treadmill today and then kind of work on that this week. And then next week we do 2.4 and we slowly increase the intensity to help train the heart aerobically because we want to train the heart muscles to accommodate to an increase in cardiovascular load. So essentially just normal cardiac rehab, just helping them get better at walking, moving, um, being active with the heart and, you know, the progressive overload kind of thing. Not too crazy. We're going slow with this patient because we don't want to bring on symptoms and we're monitoring their vital signs. So always monitor vital signs with any patient who has any sort of cardiovascular pathology or anything weird going on with their heart, which is actually a lot of patients. If you see a question that's like, what's the best thing to do right now? Um, or what's the most what intervention should you do first with this patient? Pick, monitor, vital signs. You can't go wrong. Like even if you're on your practical and it's like, what should I do? I'm like, um, I'm going to take vitals. Like no one's going to be mad at you. That's always a safe option. Make sure that you guys are make, are monitoring their vital signs, blood pressure, because remember this patient could be hypertensive, measuring um, heart rate, respiration rate, rate of perceived exertion, just checking um, what's going on with the patient. Because if they are on like beta blockers or something like that for their hypertension, remember that's going to result in a decrease in um, uh, exercise, like heart rate and blood pressure response. So RPE is great to help monitor that as well. 
All right, guys. So keywords, remember with stable angina, it's relieved with rest or nitroglycerin, occurs with exercise or increase in activity, and usually resolves within 15 minutes. Unstable angina will occur at rest. It is not relieved with nitroglycerin, and it could become a myocardial infarction. So 911 EMS services, if not, if we're not relieved within 15 minutes. And then the Prinz metal is going to be, it occurs in the morning. So if you see that one, just be aware of what it is. If they're talking about angina stuff, they will kind of maybe throw that word in, just kind of know that's morning time angina. All right, guys, sample question. A physical therapist assistant is treating a patient diagnosed with stable angina pectoris. Given typical presentation of this pathology, what symptoms would we expect to see with this patient at rest after exercise? One, increase in chest pain. Two, symptoms not relieved with nitroglycerin. Three, increase in heart rate. Or four, symptom relief. So I'll give you guys a second to think about that. All right, guys, so the answer is going to be symptom relief. So they have stable angina and pectoris, which means typical presentation means nothing weird is happening. They're not progressing to something crazy. Like just whatever the book has taught you, you go with that. If you see typical presentation, don't try to make up some scenario in your head or think of a patient that you knew in the past who had whatever disease we're talking about. Just think of the book, perfect world definition. So that means symptoms should be relieved with rest. So we tell the patient to rest after exercise, their symptoms should begin to relieve and go down. Like heart rate should start coming down. Like normally after exercise, we, we do a quick workout and then we're like a heart rate's high with rest. It should come back down. Um, symptoms, if they have symptoms, they should be relieved with nitroglycerin symptoms, not being relieved by nitroglycerin would indicate unstable angina and resting should decrease their chest pain. So the, um, first three would definitely be associated with uh, unstable angina, which at that point we would see it's a medical emergency. We need to do something about it. So I hope that this presentation helped you kind of understand the difference between the different types of angina, how they present, what we do about it. And I um, hope that's a little bit more clear. If you're confused about the etiology and why all this is happening, check out the video on coronary artery disease and then the video on uh, peripheral vascular disease because they talk about uh, atherosclerosis. All right, guys, hope this was helpful and I will see y'all soon. Take care.